Esi čiūsų. Esi tvarlės, da? Esi fiksuotų. Esi fiksuotų. Ras. Ras, ras. Ras, ras. Այսը վելոն եք շիտյացրին է, ընտացքում բարձացնում է։
President of AUA, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Mr. Pech Setrakian is the seventh president of the Armenian General Belamonut Union, AGBU, the world's largest pan-Armenian organization. Born in Beirut, Lebanon in 1949, Mr. Setrakian has been an active, lifelong AGBU member and has held various leadership positions in the organization, first in Lebanon, later in the United States. In 1977, Mr. Satrakian became the youngest person to ever be elected to the Central Board of AGBU. After several decades of service, he was elected secretary and then five years later as vice president of the Central Board. He was elected president of AGBU in 2002 and continues to serve in that capacity. During his years in the AGBU board, President uh, Satrakian closely cooperated with his, his predecessors, Alex Manukian and Luis Manukian Simon. For more than 30 years, 
Mr. Setrakian has traveled the world, strengthening ties with AGBU chapters all over the world and with Armenian youth. In particular, he has focused on youth who, as third or fourth generation diaspora Armenians, have not closely identified with their Armenian heritage. He has also expanded the union's activities in Armenia and the diaspora, focusing on new initiatives and projects. Uh, Mr. Setrakian received master's degrees in French and comparative law from St. Joseph University in Beirut and Lyon University in France. Today, he is a senior partner in a leading law firm in New York. He is a member of the New York Bar, uh, Bar Association as well as the Beirut Bar Association. He serves on the boards of various nonprofit and non governmental organizations, including important for us, the Board of Trustees of the American University of Armenia. Uh, in 2011, uh, Mr. Satrakian was awarded the Order of Honor by the President of the Republic of Armenia for his outstanding contributions to protecting the country's national interest, as well as his lifelong unwavering dedication and patriotic service to Armenia. I must add that uh, earlier this last year, uh, Mr. Setrakian uh, endowed some funds with uh, AGBU for the purpose of awards that will be given to uh, faculty. These are faculty research awards and faculty teaching excellence awards starting. The fund will generate uh, outcome, out, uh, payouts that will be used for this purpose starting in two years. And he has given funds that will be providing uh, support for this kind of awards for the next two years. So we are very grateful for his uh, generosity to the university as well for a, for a cause that we think very uh, is very important for our faculty and the quality of teaching. Uh, he will be talking about priorities, opportunities, and challenges for Armenians. Mr. Setrakian. Good evening. First, thank you for inviting me, Mr. President, and thank you for all of you who came to listen to me. I hope you will not regret the time that you are spending with me this afternoon. Uh, you know, they asked me about priorities, opportunities, and challenges. We can talk about this for uh, a semester of classes, but we'll try to engage a dialogue for the coming 30 to 40 minutes, and I would like very much to really have a, an opportunity to hear from you and to listen, because the biggest advantage and uh, privilege of being here today is to have the opportunity to be in touch with the youth, the, the, the bright youth of Armenia because we always think back home about Armenia and our programs and our priorities without really being in touch with the realities uh, on the ground. And I'm sure that uh, as a new generation, you, uh, you have your own experiences, you have your own anxieties, you have your own concerns about priorities, you have your own concerns about opportunities, and you know the challenges. Therefore, I would uh, really appreciate your input so that I can learn something from this session and take it with me. You know, opportunities, there is no limit for opportunities and priorities. For instance, priority for this university last year, our main priority was to have the opportunity to uh, have a new president on a full-time basis. And we are lucky that we got that opportunity, and I think we got one, the best among the best, with Dr. Armin Dergurelian. For all those who do not know, Dr. Armin Dergurelian is among the founders of this university. It's not a pure coincidence, it's not somebody who has been recruited outside. Uh, I remember that, I don't know how much you know about the history of this institution, it was a little bit three 
academics, three dreamers, and the youngest was Armin, with uh, Dr. Mehran Ababian and Dr. Karamardian. The whole idea started after the earthquake when the Institute of Seismic Studies in uh, Gumri was destroyed. And we thought that, not we, I mean everybody who collaborated, and AGBU and the Armenian government and the UC being among the founders who were just a team. So uh, the challenge was to build a new center and to make sure that from there on the construction code of Armenia would change and the buildings will be uh, built based on new norms to ensure some safety as Armenia is really on a uh, earthquake, uh, in an earthquake zone. And then suddenly independence came up and we saw the opportunity. So from the challenge we went to the opportunity of starting an institute, an American university, because we thought that after the collapse of Soviet Union, the uh, how to train the young generation to immediately get adapted somehow to the Western standards, especially in terms of marketing and in, in terms of law. So that's how we started an institute of law, so that we connect quickly with the Western world. And a dream came uh, into reality, and today, after almost a quarter of a century, I think you are in year 23 or 24, look what a marvelous university attracting the best of the best of the students and the young people of Armenia. And AGBU considers AUA as one of the best programs that a institution like ours should support, back, and help to develop. When I look to this hall, it's, uh, it's almost unbelievable. The only thing that we had was the old building and the AGBU office, so that you know, when you enter the main uh, hall, there is a small corner in the back, which consists, maybe it was the men's room or the ladies' room, but that was AGBU's office with two rooms, and that's how we all started. So, uh, nowadays I think that what is of major concern, I am sure, among the young people is the geopolitical situation of Armenia and the socio-economic situation of Armenia. Which comes first, I don't know, but definitely safety and security is number one priority. We do not realize it. We talk about all the other considerations, socio-economical, but we have been privileged to have an independent country. Our forefathers were dreaming for centuries about the day that they will see an independent Armenia. Most of them didn't have that chance and that opportunity, but we, their children, we saw it. And we are living it. But we are living it with all the problems that we never expected that we would have. Don't forget a little bit our last 25 years. Earthquake, sudden independence, nobody expected it to come so fast with all the problems that it created. Garabagh war, blockade by the Azeris, blockade by the Turks, a landlocked country, plus all the economical uh, conditions, including the most recent one, the collapse of the oil prices in the world, and as a result, the collapse of the Russian ruble, which has a big impact on the economy of this country. Our problems are not unique to us. Today, the whole world is facing a lot of problems. Look a little bit to what's happening in the Middle East. Who would have thought three, four years ago that would have a movement like the ISIS, the jihadists? 
the whole Middle East is collapsed now. We don't know anymore where do the frontiers and the borders begin and end, whether it's for Syria, it's for Iraq, it's for Libya, it's for Lebanon. Some people already talk about Iraq being divided into three countries, Syria divided into two countries, Libya divided into three countries. Do you imagine we criticize uh, the Israelis for having built a fence to, uh, around the, the Palestinian territories? And believe me, it is very, very ugly. I have seen it. It's, it reminds me of uh, South Africa and the apartheid. You go, you see whole towns like Beth Bethlehem, like uh, uh, Nablus. You enter you know, as if you need a uh, movie theater ticket to enter your town, and there is only one gate or two gates. It's not a pleasant life. But today, Saudi Arabia is building the same fence on its border with Iraq because they are afraid of the terrorists. Just look to the Middle East what's happening. Uh, the uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. So everywhere there is a problem. And if everywhere, at every time we're going to throw away the towel, you cannot live as human beings. You'll be always unhappy. We have to face the problems and try to find the solutions. This morning I was with a gentleman who is quite prominent he said, I did so much for this country. He, he's from the States. He said, I'm getting desperate, nothing is changing, and I'm thinking about not coming again. I said, let me tell you, everybody is free. This is a free country. And, uh, but this is not the right attitude. I said, I committed my entire life out of love and personal satisfaction. I committed myself to Armenia, to the Armenians, to the Armenian organizations. And I refuse always to use the word sacrifice because nobody in this world sacrifice. If you don't get a self-satisfaction in what you are doing, you better not do it. So I, I enjoyed it. I said, I'm not going to give up. I said, I'm optimistic in the, uh, as to the future of Armenia. Things are going to change. Nothing is permanent in life. I said, who would have thought 30 or 40 years ago that the Soviet Union will collapse, that Armenia will be independent? It happened almost over, overnight. So nothing is per permanent. There is no doubt that our most important problem is the question of immigration. We have a population which uh, we lost practically about 25% of our population. I'm not surprised. Look a little bit to what happened in Europe with the uh, economic crisis. In Spain or in France, about 25% of the young people have left for London because the opportunities are better in London. In uh, Argentina, they left for Spain. So we are in a more and more in a global society that movement is, is easier. But coming back to Armenia, obviously, job security is the most important thing. If I cannot blame the young generation that they, after going through four years of undergraduate, two years of graduate school, if they don't find a suitable job after a while to seek opportunity somewhere else. However, I can tell you, you shouldn't throw away the towel quickly. Uh, Martin Luther King's movie got the uh, Emmy Awards this week and all his slogan is you have to have a dream and the dream will come true. I think that our dream to build a strong Armenia is our number one priority. As a diasporan I tell you that a diaspora will not live too long if Armenia does not become a subject of pride for our diaspora and communities. If we take the positive signs of this country, because everything is not negative, and this country's economy is a small economy. Now my organization's main target is to focus, to forget a little bit about benevolence, to try to organize ourselves with people, with individuals, 
who have already committed themselves to Armenia, like people like Ruben Vartanian, you heard of him, I'm sure, Sam Simonian, who did the Tumo Center, Eduardo Arnakian, and if we have three Arnakians and three more uh, uh, Sam Simonians and uh, three more Ruben Vartanian, this economy will come up. So, this is our priority. And hopefully, there is no doubt that our key problem is a blockade by Turkey and Azerbaijan and the war of Karabakh. This country keeps an army of about 80,000 soldiers, spends about over a billion dollars for the defense. Imagine that a billion dollars normally this country should not have more than an army of 30,000 people in times of peace. If that billion dollars, half of it is reinvested in the economy. Now it's been for 22, 23 years of Arab war. And it's really drained our uh, economic uh, capabilities. But sooner or later, I'm sure even with Turkey, I know that it sounds hopeless now. If you follow the news about Erdogan and his policies, and uh, but sooner or later it's going to happen. I mean, it's like looking to a cup which is half empty or half full. We are a landlocked country. But if we have one day the opportunity of opening the borders, being landlocked, you, you can be the best servicing center where everything has to go through our territory. And then the, 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 this city, Yerevan, can become a center, an educational center, which anyhow, we are making all the efforts now to make whether it's AUA or in general Yerevan as a reference for educational uh, center, medical center, religious tourism. We have not done what we should have done 10 or 15 years ago. So our priority now, since we're talking uh, in the, uh, by order, is what can we do to create jobs in Armenia? And all our efforts is going to be geared towards in that direction. I think that I don't know how many of the young people, if they have a secure job upon their graduation, would consider leaving the country. Any reaction? And let me ask a question. How many of you will think about leaving if you don't find a job after two years of graduation? Which is very normal. I would, have, I would do the same thing too. So, I know that it's easier to preach than to do. I'm not preaching now patients who are not naive. We know that the situations are difficult. But believe me, not only HBU, but many, many people in the diaspora today have reached the conclusion, let's forget about other priorities. Let's go after investors to create jobs. Because one thing, I personally believe in the use of Armenia. I believe, because it's based on experience. I think that, I hope that uh, nobody is taping this to uh, repeat it in the diaspora. For a reason or another, the young students, the young people of Armenia, they have a much higher IQ in average, not everybody, in average, than the average of the Armenian diaspora news. How do I know that? Because when they apply for a scholarship, we look to their grades. The average of the Armenian students from Armenia, for GPA purposes, which is a maximum of four, they range between 3.4 to 3.7, 3.8. If we, if we look to the uh, diasporan uh, scholarship uh, candidates, it ranges between 2.9 and 3.3. That's why, if you run statistics at the Ivy Leagues in America, about 75% of the Armenian students who are enrolled in Ivy Leagues are from Armenia or from the Eastern Bloc, from the former Soviet republics, and 25 only from the United States. So you are smart, you are capable, but you are the future of this country at the same time. You know, you don't abandon home 
and leave behind. Even if it takes a little bit of sacrifice, not total sacrifice, but a little bit of sacrifice. For us, for me, AUA, the main philosophical issue with AUA for me is that it stands for principles. It stands for Western values. It stands for human rights. It stands for fight against corruption. It stands for good governance. If the students of this institute are going to give up, then really you should take with you a some sense of responsibility for, for having abandoned the ship. We cannot just turn our back. From here, life overseas looks and sounds rosy, but believe me, it's a very tough and hard life. When I tell people in the United States that we claim to be the champions of all what capitalism can offer. But if it is a capitalism that you can fire or terminate your assistant or your secretary who has been with you for 20 years or 30 years with three hours notice without severance pay, or if a citizen who is not enrolled in an institution and he doesn't have an employer who secures uh, a medical insurance, and if he's of a certain age, practically he cannot have medical coverage and he has always to rush and go into an emergency room always claiming that he's going to die otherwise he will not get any medical help. Uh, we are in a country that we have labor laws which do not recognize the right to vacation. In the academic world you are very comfortable. You don't realize these things but in the in our daily world. And I'm revolted. And yet, it is a country of opportunity. I think that it's the number one in terms of standing for principles, standing for values. But it has its problems too. In, uh, let me see, I'm on track, I guess. Uh, therefore, conclusion, we are going we are going to try to do our best to help the new generation, but the new generation should also take responsibility for the future of this country. I still believe that, like uh, most of the former Soviet republics, didn't have the revolution. I think that even in Armenia, we'll have a white revolution, when I say white revolution, a new generation coming up Whatever you are being taught here, it goes beyond the science or the knowledge. It's values. You cannot be pushed around. It takes time, but sooner or later, it's going to come. And together, I think, we can dream of a brighter future. I am committed. HBU is committed. I know a lot of people who are committed. And you have to be committed too. But yet, if you don't find a job, I don't blame you. So this is, in, a, in short, what I wanted to address. I can talk longer, but I don't think it will add too much. I think you got the gist of what I was trying to say. I would like really to hear from you. And I want you to challenge me. The challenge is it's challenging me. And I hope I will succeed in pushing you to challenge me and others. Nobody? We have microphones on both sides, <coughs> and it would be very good for Thank you. Can you hear me? Sorry, I don't want to be rude. Just one second. I would like to ask you about AGBU's uh, program to promote repatriation to Armenia. Uh, and my second um, uh, point is uh, about uh, women's involvement in the army. Um, so I would like that you expand on that. Thank you.
Well, uh, uh, the first question was about uh, AGBU's repatriation program. Uh, you know that many of you have parents who originally were living in countries of the Middle East in the 40s. And I know that for many, repatriation left a sour feeling, but it was very important for national interest. And AGBU in 1946 uh, organized, was one of the organizers, but the only financier of the repatriation movement. And we helped over 200,000 Armenians to come back to Armenia in 46. Uh, repatriation, yesterday I was at uh, the Shirin of, uh, or the, uh, of uh, Father Gomidas. And I remember that in 1952, 1953, it was then AGBU's President Karagozian who engaged in uh, negotiations with the then Soviet authorities to convince them to allow to bring back his ashes to Armenia and HBU financed it. To tell you, as an introduction to my answer, it has been always our effort to help repatriation to Armenia. Personally, I bought an apartment here and I was just telling uh, Dr. Dirigerian, maybe I have been to Armenia 40 times or 50 times, and yet outside Yerevan, I think the only places that I visited uh, so far are Lake Sevan, Dirijan, and Garabagh because it didn't, it didn't occur, it's, I didn't buy the apartment for joy or uh, festivities, because I believe that if I have such a strong feeling, I should have a place, my, my own place in Armenia. And there are many of us. In my building, we have four central board members of HBU who have their residences here. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There are many who also who, uh, yesterday I was talking with the mayor of uh, Yerevan, about 30% of the units sold uh, in recent years are by uh, foreigners. I mean, not foreign people like us from the diaspora. Now, we have to start an effort about repatriation, but repatriation is a very costly, both in terms of financial and in human uh, resources. It's not easy. But one of the programs which is now uh, being contemplated is to encourage, uh, like Israel does, to encourage, to encourage retired Armenians from the United States and other places and encourage them to move to Armenia. But that's based on some economical and logic and other considerations. In the United States, I think the maximum that uh, an employee can get uh, upon retirement at the age of 70 is about $2,100. That's the limit, I guess, of the Social Security. Yeah. And uh, usually in the past, you know, the beauty of America was that at the age of 20, 25, you get married. I'm talking, I'm going back now to the 70s and 80s. Uh, you buy a house for 100000 200000 You work all your life. You retire, you have a little bit of a saving, you uh, get your social security, and you sell your house after 30 years for 400 or 500 or 600 thousand dollars. You take that money, and after the age of 65, you don't pay tax on the uh, capital gain when it's your first residence, and they move to Florida or somewhere which is cheaper and uh, it's a uh, better quality of life from the northeast, let's say. And, hmm? and and uh, they live comfortably. Today, uh, if you go to New York or any place in the States or the big cities, you see all the new constructions, they say, for rental, for rental, for rental. You don't see for sale. You start wondering why for rental. Because the new generation with the economic conditions in, uh, in the state, they cannot afford buying a house. They cannot afford putting a down payment. But since if they are a couple, whether married or uh, not, they live uh, together. If they both work, they will be able to pay a very high rent. But what is going to happen when they will retire, 
They wouldn't build, have built any equity in their life. And I see the crisis coming up in 10, 15 years, because since the year 2000, interest, bank interest is about in the range of 0.1 to 0.5 percent, or maximum of 1 percent, plus taxable. So from your savings, you don't get anything. The stock market went down all the way from 14,000 to 7,000, which practically people were forced to sell their shares, except the rich, who kept it, and now it's at 17,000, 18,000. So what is left? They don't have their uh, portfolio of investment. They don't get any interest. And they don't have a house to sell and make money. And housing in America between 2000 and 2014, the price that I paid for my own house in New Jersey in 1988, today, if I sell it, I get exactly the same price in 30 years. So we are talking about socio-economic problems. This is, a, this is a, a typical. So coming to your question is to encourage the re retired Armenians, because if they come to Armenia and the husband, uh, between husband and wife, they have about $3,000 or $4,000 income from social security, they can live comfortably here. And now you tell me, oh, you are going to bring only the, the old people? But it's a constituency. They will come, they will bring money. Because they, after they will come here and spend. But plus, then their children will come and visit them. Their grandchildren will come and visit them. I'm not saying that the only thing that we can do, but this is now one of our targets to try to start a campaign convincing Armenians. First, you have the quality of, uh, you have the quality of life in Armenia, which is by far, one thing I can tell you, quality of life in Armenia or quality of life in Lebanon is by far a better quality of life than my daily life in New York, believe me. It's, uh, the, uh, you want to be successful? It's a big challenge because everybody wants to be successful in big cities. It's a shark's world. And to survive, many people on the road, they just abandon. So, take into consideration all these points and reach your own conclusions. And what was your second question? Women in the military. Ah, women in the military. Well, I'm... President wants to talk to you for five minutes. Really? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we we take five minutes break. You stay. Uh, he has a, an urgent call, telephone call. <laughs> but I'll I'll take. Uh, uh, I, I want to comment on this repatriation. Uh, one of the things we at this university are doing is attracting students who, from abroad who could come here and study and get their degrees and some of them may fall in love with the country and may decide to stay here so that's AUA can play a role in this repatriation but please remain stand think about questions you may ask uh, after all he's the president of AGBU and they have many programs so some of your suggestions may influence his thinking and the board's thinking and, and AGBU's future program. So think about that.
Sorry. Sometimes duty calls. Uh, where were we? The second question. Yeah, army. Well, uh, first of all, I uh, I have two daughters. I don't have sons, and I'm so lucky. <laughs> and I think that they are as ca capable in challenging any male competitor. So I hope that the male students will not be angry with me, but you have a challenge. As a matter of fact, let me tell you, in my profession, I realize more and more, not more, I always realized that women, as genetically, or uh, for whatever reason, they have the opportunity to be better lawyers than men. They have a more organized mind, they are more detail-oriented, and you know, in our profession, in a contract or anything, there is, I always say to my colleagues, young colleagues, there is no detail which is too small to be ignored. And the difference between a lawyer and another is the one who can pick really the last detail of a 50-page brief to catch the weakness and go back and attack. And women are much better. When uh, my associates prepare files for me, you see that you give the same document to a male or a female. The female comes up with much more detailed, I always prefer to look <laughs> to, to the uh, job prepared by, uh, by a female lawyer. So coming to the army, obviously I think that uh, there is a question always about whether by nature women have the same physical force and ability. But uh, it has been proven now more and more in most of the Western armies like the United States or Europe that women are playing a very important role in the army. And you know, serving in the army, it's like a calling. It's a mission. You should like it. If you like it, you can do everything. So personally, I'm definitely in favor unless uh, it's against the trend in this country for the women to accept to serve in the army. Is it mandatory for women to serve? No. 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 So, oh, oh, if it's uh, by, by pure choice, like in Israel, it's, it's mandatory. So I, I believe that the, the world would have been a better place if it was run by more women than men. Believe me. Why am I so much? Because I think there are more women sitting here than and the men are there, so I'm being impressed. <laughs> Another question? Challenges, challenges. Say that I am wrong. Say that, um... Thank you very much for your uh, optimistic, positive uh, speech. And I'm very happy to hear that AGB is taking steps to create more jobs in Armenia. Uh, my question is what type of jobs are you planning to create? Because some of us want to start our own company or want to start our own nonprofit organization and we don't have the resources to start that. And is AGB taking that into consideration as well or not? Absolutely. We think that, first of all, high tech is one of the areas that we have really to promote. You would be surprised. We have on our board uh, a member, Yervant uh, Zorian, who runs 
in China? Synopsis. Synopsis. You know that today they have 50 to 75 vacancies for engineers and they don't have candidates. Who was the other day was telling us again that the hundreds uh, of engineers. You can employ hundreds of engineers. So, uh, we need uh, quali qualified uh, applicants. And uh, even more interesting, you can talk to Mr. Salatian about startups. He is the man. And now we are uh, uh, definitely, we believe that the Armenians, Armenians in general are very talented that they can take initiatives. Armenians are not used to just be regular workers. And even during the Soviet era, if you go back, one of our pride was the success of Armenians in uh, the Soviet programs, whether it's for the space program and otherwise. So, uh, yes, uh, it's, uh, it's very much uh, in that direction. It is inclusive. And one thing we should be careful I think that uh, President Der Grey and also I'm sure uh, will focus on it. It's uh, the tendency more and more for people to go always to uh, human studies, like humanities. Hmm? From humanities. humanities, like law, business, business. This country, there is, there is a certain number it can absorb. BBA, BA, uh, it's uh, or law. We, uh, the power of this country is really in its in, uh, engineering, technology, uh, and uh, the free market has this problem. And we have witnessed in many places, sometimes you have so many engineers that there is no more room. You miss the lawyers and the uh, accountants and others. Then it goes the other way. And I think we should be if I am a student, I will see where is the opportunity of the market. We are talking about opportunities. Thank you very much. Um, I completely share your ideas about Armenians, but we have a big problem about mindset. Um, I've been working in a multinational environments, and I noticed that even though Armenians have really good capacity, we have uh, blockaded, let's say, mindset. And maybe this is somehow affected by the closed borders with our neighbors. Um, what I am very much uh, sure is that we really need to um, have experienced uh, exchange with diaspora and Armenians, with prominent people like you, and I think this can be done uh, through technology. And what do you think about this? Can you specify a little bit more what yes, you mean? Yes, for example, um, even in Ruben Vartanian's foundation, people working, local Armenians working here are, let's say, close-minded. We really need open-minded people. And this is very much uh, common, especially in youth. Um, yeah. uh, and I am sure that we can do um, many experience exchange programs. Maybe AGBU can also do that or support this kind of project. And um, this can be done through technology. With this, I mean, internet, Skype, maybe we can have many uh, conference calls through internet. In this case, maybe we can somehow share these mindset problems. Uh, you know, the first answer is that that's why you are at AUA. Yes. <laughs> because AUA offers that environment of openness to the world. On the but other I hand... I think it's not enough. Yeah, AUA but no, no, you are absolutely right. And I will continue. We have been uh, running for the last 20 years, I guess, 25 years. On one hand, our internship programs, in New York, Armenia. We started in Moscow, we stopped, but we're going to resume. London as, if the, uh, as of this summer. And we often had many students from Armenia who joined the internship program. And it had, it had been very good for the diasporan youth because they come in contact with the reality of Armenia and vice versa. Besides that, we have about a database of about 12,000 uh, uh, young professionals, young graduates from colleges. And we try to establish this networking. 
I think maybe if you have a student's organization here which has uh, some structure, we can connect. I am a student council. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I will give you the contacts. Uh, or uh, Mr. Yakubian, who's here, or Mr. Ghazarian, can put you in contact and integrate that system. I believe very much in that, very, very much. As a matter of fact, even between our schools now in the diaspora, like between Argentina and uh, Los Angeles, we have links of classes, we have link of gatherings, Hantesnev, together, because we have to take advantage of the technology and we have to bring people together, because the most important thing uh, uh, for us, when you are a small nation, it's really the idea that you are part of a whole. The, and the, the biggest, uh, and uh, philosophically, uh, we believe that one of the role of AGBU, what is the difference with other organizations, really this multinational presence where you can put in touch the Armenians from Argentina, from Australia, from, and definitely, and we will finance the need for such a networking. No other questions? Yes? Hear me. Uh, I'm in May alumni 2000 and now I'm from banking finance, but the question I have is, it has two sides, it just, you know, but uh, the role of the ASBER were very huge you know, in the development of all Armenians in the beginning. And um, to me, the ASBER is uh, positioning is, uh, you know, whether it's an organization or a person, but it's mostly the charity-based philanthropic type of approach to Armenia. Some selective investments that might have been, you know, viewed as, as a success stories. But the charity is a more preferred type of involvement. Anything that goes to um, undermining the current status quo of the government system in Armenia is absolutely out of the agenda of any diaspora organization. You, know. you can go into the extremes defining the state as an authoritarian, kleptocratic, and you know, run by the group of the clerics, or you can be more soft on, on, on expression, whether it's a you know, managed democracy with the selective justice, etc., etc., because essentially, at the end of the day, the main problem of the current Armenia is that we have lack of the leadership, or let's say, compromised leadership. That's my personal view. And the diaspora was kind of always pulled back in terms of engaging with the government that might have direct or indirect critics towards the approach they have, at least to the questions that within their discretion. You mentioned about two big dimensions as a challenge, geopolitics, okay, we don't have lots of discretion on that, but certain socio-economic problems can be well managed and solved, so, you know, I covered the yeah. aspect of the problems, what's your view on that? But the main point is that the diaspora is, is not that active, in my opinion, as it might, as it could have been in terms of exerting certain rational and manageable pressure on the rulers of, of this country. Look, uh, you raise many issues in one question, and I will try to dice, uh, decipher and answer. First, whether we are oriented to our charities. There is, uh, there is a time and place for everything. Like after the earthquake, definitely humanitarian efforts were needed. But at the same time, just in the aftermath, the creation of this institution that you are here now was another action which didn't have anything with charity. It had to do with nation building. And I think that you are a graduate of this uh, university and I'm sure you recognize that it made a difference in your, in your life. And today you are standing and asking challenging questions which is what, uh, exactly what uh, you should do. On the other hand, there were periods when after the earthquake, for instance, and the independence, I can speak for our, my organization first. Our organization was so much concerned that the Armenian talent in art, in performing arts and music, which is the soul of our nation, were afraid that the Philharmonic will collapse, the uh, opera will collapse, because people would find easier opportunities to go to Madrid and other places, and immediately we practically for, uh, I don't know how many years, 20 years? 20 years? For 20 years, we maintained the Philharmonic, we helped the opera, 
And people criticize that, saying, people are starving. We believe that nobody starves these days. You can always make it, but if you, you intellectually starve, the Armenian nation will not be the same. So our priority there, so you have to see where we come from. It's the nation building element. Because I believe that we are among the rare people where we are a nation beyond borders. Armenia as a state and the church are basic elements, but in order to maintain the, uh, our, our uh, strongest link to the nation is art, music, and even now, priority at HBU for, to get scholarship is people involved in the field of performing arts. Because we believe that if one day we can replace the late Aram Khashadurian, it will bring much more to the Armenian world than uh, 10 engineers or 100 lawyers or uh, anything else. Because we need heroes. Aram Khashadurian was a hero. Whenever I'm on a plane, sleeping, snoozing, I'm listening to classical music, whenever I hear Aram Khashadurian, as if somebody pinched me that, hey, you know, this is you, this is your people. Or for the French, Charles Zavour. So you go by, by, by needs. Our priority, at least uh, during the last 20, 25 years, we are concerned as much as you are, believe me. We are not proud of the corruption which is in the country. We are not proud of certain things. But at the same time, we are realistic and proud of the achievements. We look to the positive because we are not so much, if there is any movement which is going to come up in this country, it's going to be through the new generation which is living here. Not the guys who are living in New York or Paris or other places. But like this institution, which as Dr. Arman knows, AGBU uh, through the years has committed a lot of funds because we believe that the values that you are being taught here will arm you to take the step. We are cognizant of the problems, but as far as we are concerned, regimes go and come, political parties come and go. We are engaged on long-term nation building. Our organization in the hot, toughest days of communism, we supported Armenia. We built institutions in Armenia. We were criticized during the McCarthy era for those who, of a certain generation who remember what McCarthy was, we have been really harassed. But we believe that this is the land that we have to build. So our priorities are first, as I said, how we can slow down uh, expatriation, how we can create jobs, and how we can help preparing a new generations of Armenian. Earlier I uh, mentioned something like white revolution. Sooner or later it will happen. And the situation will improve. But as, as being shy, it's not a question of shy. We are not, believe me, uh, when we, we do not have any interest in criticizing the government openly for the sake of criticizing. We are not a political party which has gains to, in, the, in the voting from an opposition, oh, because we are criticizing the government. That's why the, the various governments which uh, came after the independence trusted us, trusted our organization, because they knew that whenever we criticize them, when we talk about them, and believe me, we talk about all these problems, they know that we are doing it in good faith for the best interest of the country. So it's a very delicate issue. But I mentioned uh, the issue, so I'm not shying away from the issues. Yes, we know that we have problems. We have to continue fighting. But as I said, at the same time, under all the circumstances, we are out of the uh, former uh, republics. We are the only country, after all, which came closest to some of the Western values. We had had presidential elections, Half fair, not fair, believe me, there is no perfect uh, election. Look to the United States. The Koch brothers last week committed a billion dollars just to defeat another candidate. When you have a billion dollars by somebody, do you think my vote or your vote or his vote will, uh, will make a difference? Do you think that we have a perfect democracy, first of all? The French Jean-Jacques Rousseau was really the first one who came up with the idea of democracy, and he defined it as myth or reality. Because if you take real democracy, the definition is 
every member of the minority should find in the decision of the majority the reflection of his dissent. You explain it to me. Like uh, in Armenian, they used to say uh, among the Eintapsis, uh, what is philosophy? I don't know what I'm saying. Pirisopait Yuninchegese. Martin is a shot barter. Yes, because the Pamukis and Tunches are scared. Twins in the Pamukis says, Yes, I'm scared. I'm not going to send Pirisopa. So, in conclusion, I share your concern. And as I said, these are our priorities. And I think the more you secure jobs, the more you have a better quality of life, the system will change. The system will come under pressure. And everybody is not bad in the system. They are the, the, some bad apples which unfortunately uh, color everybody. But they are efforts uh, to be made. Uh, this week I had uh, the chance to spend some time with the military command on various subjects. You know, when you see these young people, I, I was at the uh, anniversary of the army, and when I saw the pictures of those 14 young soldiers who have been killed recently, I came out. I said, well, what is my priority? I have Armenian kids dying for this land, for me to come and stand here and make speeches? You know, uh, it's, it's different. You cannot uh, live all the time with the panic, but it, it's, 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 it's a difficult, we are going through difficult circumstances. All I can do is I pray God that somehow we'll have some break somewhere. And our, it's part of our history, but again I say we're going to fight. I will fight for this country as much as I can, and I remain optimistic. Did I answer your question? Can it reflect? Yes, very good. Um, this is like in a debate. You have two minutes. Yeah, it's true. It's not. It's not about that everybody's bad, and I didn't uh, didn't, didn't uh, you know, mean it by any chance. But let me put it another way. In my opinion, there are certain areas where. Um, managed to concentrate the effort from the diaspora and organization and you as a leader to improve the, the, the impact and, and the involvement. And uh, we can like, take, let's say, you know, you have all these foreign um, international financial institutions that institution make grant money, they attach conditionalities. And you can discuss if this conditionality is correct or wrong or where, whether they are politically driven or not. So if someone comes with 100 million investment in this country, if he brings certain capacity to build nation building, let's say he sits down with the government and says, look, this is what we want to invest. I have a couple of lawyers, a couple of other, other, other professionals who would suggest to implement this reform in particular, subject to my, me, me putting money into it. And we can be very selective in, in, from perspective, not entering into dangerous areas. So this is kind of a managed approach that I was suggesting. So I'm not saying that it has to be an explicit revolution because it's not right for this country and probably some people abuse the system because of the safety security being priority and they hide behind that. So you know, all the, all the things you might say is, okay, there is a war, war uh, risk, that's why we can't you know, take care or, or just close eyes on this guy. But you, the diaspora can be very selective in picking up certain areas and say, uh, Renvar Daniels Diligent Initiative, for example, if they come up with some legislation that would improve the city, this type of uh, engagement that I'm suggesting, so essentially is bringing in expertise, but you have the discretion and the leverage, which is money. You are, you are, you are correct. Just in line of what you just said, for the last year we have retained McKinsey as consultant, that because we need almost a new HBU. Because after 100, the centennial of the genocide, for me it's an opportunity to reassess all our institutions, all our priorities. Because don't forget, most of these institutions, they operated for 100 years after the genocide, always under the mentality of the victim, of the weak. Uh, now, it's high time to rise. And uh, in, the, in the definition, when I said this, uh, nation beyond borders, 
our aim, and we are working closely with many, you know, Sam Simonian is vice president of HBU, uh, Nubarafian, if you heard of him, is a member of the board, uh, Joseph Ugurlian, I don't know if you heard about his project, about Italian the companies, he's doing those, his hydraulic projects in Harabagh, is a member of the board. So, within, all together with McKinsey, we are trying to develop a roadmap. A roadmap putting priorities. What does the country need? In the, like, uh, you have, uh, and then when you go to investor, I right, said, okay, you want to develop what? An engineering network, a factory, in this roadmap, maybe this is a priority, maybe this is not a priority. And create a unit with employees and like HB will have subsidiaries. Like we are now we are developing the HBU TUMO partnership. In Garabagh, we are financing the establishment of a new TUMO center. In Beirut, we found a sponsor for a Beirut TUMO, but we said one condition. Everybody who wants to start something in the diaspora like TUMO, he has to adopt a TUMO in Armenia in, a, in another city or town. In Argentina, there is a manufacturer who wants to start a TUMO. We are dealing with him. We will do the TUMO and we will do the TUMO here. Even though it's a challenge, we don't know how much the TUMO concept will be sellable in the diaspora. But you, you see, all these are issues in process. We don't have a solution of everything. And let me tell you, I confess one thing. Personally, I am the first one to be so far disappointed in the diaspora. I don't think that the diaspora, especially the Western diaspora, the old traditional diaspora, I don't think that they came up to the plate the way that they, they should have done it. It's a, for me, it's unacceptable that we call Armenia Fund and worldwide we raise $12 million. I was the first president of Armenia Fund when we established it in 2003 with Gagi Karutunian at the request of Levon David Rossian, president. My dream was, hey, 10 million Armenians, 1 million giving in the average $100, you should be easily able to raise $100 million. And at the last meeting two years ago, I suggested to the president to shut down the Armenia Fund and to start something new because it didn't work. I said, shame on us. What are the Azeris and the Turks are going to say? It's demystifying the power of the diaspora. The diaspora has been somehow not at the level of what I personally would have expected. But let me tell you one thing on the other hand. Every donation, every philanthropist, every uh, gift that we receive nowadays, there is one condition attached to it. It has to be spent in Armenia. From, from the last, I don't know, 10, 15 uh, major donations that we received, they want to do something in Armenia. Because they realize that without Armenia, diaspora will not survive anyhow. But once we have a strong Armenia, then you will see how to use, then we'll organize the diaspora. I mean, your questions are very pertinent. Unfortunately, I don't have specific answer because nobody has specific answers. And whoever tells you that I have the answer, you say, go back, something is wrong in your mind here. <coughs> Another question? What is the status of the roadmap that you mentioned? Uh, is we, can we participate? Can we contribute to it somehow? I think so. You know, it, it's, in, it's in process. First, we had to take the first step to tell the world that the HB of today is not valid anymore for HB of tomorrow. I told my board, if we are going to continue AGBU as we used to be, I think after serving for almost for almost 38 years on the board, being vice president, president, it's time for me to go home. Because I don't think that I can offer anything else because we are becoming a caretaking institution. You get the income, you distribute. You know exactly what to do with it. But if we are going to move to the next stage and create this multinational, real, national power institution where the state is part, the church is part, but it goes beyond. Then I'm willing to stay because to help because to make the transition you have a lot of the old school forces who will try to pull you back. And I think I have enough, I have built enough credibility that I can
ignore and move on, but it's a big challenge because if you succeed, if you say if you fail, you would have destroyed the past and not built the new. And as I said, uh, we have very strong uh, participation for, from individuals like Rupin Vartanian and, and uh, Nubar and uh, all these people. We meet regularly. We have another meeting on Tuesday in New York. And the roadmap, it's, it takes shape, you know. It, it's not something that you can... Now we have agreed on the idea of the roadmap, especially after uh, Rupin did the Dirigent International School. Suddenly, I think he also realized that you cannot have a project in the air out of the blue. It should be part of a whole roadmap as to what is needed where. Even the institutions, the role that AUA will play in this country, the role that the state university, we cannot ignore the state university because by the end of the day, the state university is the strongest element to build a, a nation. So we have all the, and I take the centennial, you always have to find an excuse. I think the centennial of the genocide as the opportunity to reassess ourselves as Armenians as to what we stand for, what is it to be Armenian, and what kind of country we want to, uh, we want to build. Thank you very much. Unless you have a, a question, you want? I have everyone correctly. Can I ask one short question? Um, you mentioned that the question of was raised earlier, that I wanted to elaborate on that, uh, about uh, uh, founding, uh, establishing our own companies here, for instance, if um, there is a group of AUA alumni who has um, a brilliant project and uh, needs an assistance, uh, not only in terms of money, uh, can they just turn to you, to AGBU, so that, uh, how does this work? You know, well, maybe we have to start somewhere. Why don't you see the project? I think that AUA had adopted the pro uh, a special program, no, of, uh, uh, it's a unit uh, incubation. Yeah, incubation. But we, yes, we do. Yeah. It, it might be a vehicle in which uh, alumni could also participate. That's what I'm, I was coming to, and uh, maybe we can consider some scholarships for that kind of program. The, the definitely, individual initiative is very important. Maybe I can clarify what we're talking about. We, we, we're building a center of innovation technology and innovations. And the idea is that students, faculty, alumni, and people from outside will come up. Hopefully, there will be ideas, maybe some from outside, some from within. Some funding that activity could start with students and researchers and developers. And uh, the incubation part of this is that when it matures to a certain level, then it will go on and make us create a startup. And uh, uh, hopefully, the idea is that there'll be funding for it, either from outside companies or maybe grants, investors, angels, VCs, and so on. So this is uh, something that uh, uh, this summer, the infrastructure we could build. We have a grant from the ASHA, American Schools and Hospitals Abroad, and uh, we will need some funding in terms of the op operations. Yeah, you know, while you were talking, uh, Armin, I thought about the idea. For instance, I don't know in which field we are talking about, but I'm sure if, uh, I don't know, if, let's say uh, engineering, if you have something interesting, there are so many successful uh, engineers now uh, are having big enterprises. If they have programs that we can approach them to sponsor a certain type of new businesses in Armenia. Uh, because there is money, you have to go and dig and find it. And Networking is the critical thing. Absolutely, yeah. As, as I said... The center is to create that yeah. infrastructure and the networking that allows that yeah. to happen. Well, well, uh, when I say roadmap for AGBU, that's why the efforts are more like this 12,000. I said, okay, we have this 12,000 bases of uh, young professionals. But what are we doing out of them? We have really to create the century. As a matter of fact, did you see the new magazine of AGBU, Insider? Yeah, but if you open it, we started that, I mean, I, we, the young uh, 
Professor said that on keyboard is there. Inside the magazine in supplement. Yerevan magazine at Vorosk Sanganel. You will see how many young talents of Armenians, uh, recipients of HBO scholarship and others, now, uh, like, let's say fashion. In the fashion industry, there is this guy, is it an H&M, not uh, fashion? He is the chief designer for H&M. A young 25-year-old kid. Now, every time that there is this gathering, he comes, he wants to do something. Uh, Twitterin Dran, Rafi, Rafi Krikorian. He came to Miami. He says, tell me how I can help. What can I do? Rafi Krikorian is uh, number two, number three at Twitter. So, as Amina, they are eye-openers that we have to change when we say creating jobs. It's with this networking that you mentioned. The, as a matter of fact, the, the Baskin is behind that part of our program, creating a global networking, global networking. And this is part uh, of uh, the answer to your question, but we're, we're, with what uh, Dr. Armin uh, mentioned, well, you can join either the program, which are already the incubation programs, or or you can try on your own and you can write to us. But maybe it's good to institutionalize because I'm sure there are many young Armenians, uh, graduates of this or other universities, who really want to start that experience. I don't know, have you visited the National Center in Chanuna? Saratianina? National Instruments. Hmm? National Instruments. Uh, have you had the chance to visit? Uh, I'm not an engineer or technology, but I was quite impressed. Two, three young people working on something because they have a problem in Kazakhstan and they're, I don't know what, uh, the oil leveling is not working and they are fixing it or they had things. Uh, the personal initiative is always good. If I may, uh, I, I don't know the details uh, a couple of years ago, uh, through ArmTech and efforts that were done with ArmTech is this uh, annual conference that happens. A venture cap or venture cap on the investment fund was established in Silicon Valley for uh, helping the investments uh, for startups in Armenia. It's a small fund. I think it's. Six million. Does anybody know about this? Uh, yeah, five million. Five million. So it's a small fund, but uh, I, people in Armenia who have uh, good ideas in the area of technology, they could uh, explore possibility of investment from this fund. But of course, five, six million is a very, very small amount. It, it would be good if this fund grows and, and there's an infrastructure that allows. Uh, people with good ideas to apply. And this, of course, has to be better. You know, not every idea is good, even if the uh, even if it comes from Armenia is the best. <laughs> but it has to be better. It has to be uh, peer reviewed, and uh, then, uh, if appropriate, then invested. So, something like this has started uh, at a small scale. The government liberates all uh, taxes about three years, up to fifteen years. Yeah, but uh, you know, no, I remember when it, they started, it made big noise, but recently, you, it's good that you reminded me. I don't hear too much about it as it used to, but it can be done. And uh, all these guys in uh, high tech, whether it's Sam Simonian or Eli Inchirana, Baskin? Oh, yeah. Huh. yeah. He was, again, Eli came to Miami and he wants to, uh, uh, to do more and this is when I say a roadmap, when you can go and say, hey, in high tech, this is what we're going to, to do. The high tech subsidiary will have its own board, its own employees. The, uh, and they can do a lot. Just these two guys together can do a lot in the high tech industry. You asked me a question whether you can participate in the roadmap. I didn't avoid the question, just forget it. 
I think at a certain time, yes, because this is a process. But at the beginning, we have to start first putting it uh, on track as this is something we have been thinking about for the last five, six, seven years. And this is going to create a lot of problems in the diaspora because we cannot do everything. We're going to cut more and more our allocations in the diaspora, like a school in Argentina, a school in Uruguay, a school in uh, Australia. You know, you talk about priorities. And Dr. Armin knows very well, as far as education institution, for us as AGPU, our number one priority is this institution. Because we believe that the American University of Armenia can do more to the Armenian world than our schools of the diaspora. Now, if we, if, but if uh, I cannot, if uh, but taking out of context, I will have a revolution, and I'm going to have a revolution. But we have to explain to people because when we started our schools in Armenia, in uh, the diaspora, we were living mainly under the Ottoman Empire, and we were practically we were called the. Uh, as they say in Arabic, Khawarij, uh, Milan, Millet. And we were, we were not citizens of second class only. You were living apart. You had your schools, you had what they call Aska in Durk. You pay your taxes to the church, the church runs the schools. And from there, uh, after the genocide, we came to the Middle East. And this, uh, even though the Arab Muslims, have been very, very good to the Armenians. They welcomed us in Syria. The Syrian people, we owe a great uh, uh, gratitude to the Syrian people. And maybe, Vasquez, we forgot during those meetings to talk about that, the centennial, to thank the populations. Most of our population came through Syria. The others went through those who were more closer to Izmir and Istanbul, through Marseille and, and, and France. So the, we had to start schools because they didn't want their children to be in schools with Muslim kids because they had this trauma of the Islam of uh, Turkey. That's how we had schools and we didn't have in the Middle East public school system. But now, philosophically, for me it's a problem. How can you justify in France or in the United States where Armenians now do not pay Aska in Durk of $25 a year, but they pay 50 to 52 percent of their income to the government, against which they have the privilege of having very good education. You have some areas where public schooling is not very good, but still, let's take Canada, or let's take the France. You know that in France, if you say that your child goes to a private school, some people start uh, wondering whether your child is uh, normal, is, it, uh, is he up to standard, because the best schools in France are the public schools. How can you tell to a parent in France, with a, Armenians still, in general, socioeconomically, we are not rich in the diaspora. We are in the lower middle class as an average. Don't compare us to the Hariyas. We are in the lower middle class as a total in the average. And then you tell these parents, you know what? After you pay 50%, in France they reach 55% of taxes. You know, you have to send your children to an Armenian school. And you have to pay practically the other, the half of the half of your income for the schooling of your children so that they learn Armenian. Personally, I don't think that we have the right to put this moral obligation on people. In France, Armenian language is admitted as an official language. Like, uh, besides French, you can take your exam in languages, either in German, in English, in Armenian. It is called langue vivante. So there is this recognition. You can have uh, uh, teachers teaching Armenian. You can pass, uh, you can uh, take the baccalaureate with Armenian as second language. And they are forced, if you are Armenian, to bring you an Armenian examiner uh, for the oral examination. In a country where they are so pro-Armenian, France is uh, the, the closest as to the humanistic values. As a matter of fact, human rights and everything started back with the French Revolution. Instead, 
what I'm telling people, if we are, we succeed in bringing, our goal should be every child, but even if we don't succeed with every child, in the, between the age of 12 to 18, or two, once or twice during his life to Armenia, and once between when during his college years of a young professional to come to Armenia, and you developed with all the now AVC, the virtual college, and all the uh, uh, online learning, you can provide the same education. And I do not see so much the need to run our Armenian day schools and spend the fortune, because with, with the deficit of two schools that we have in the diaspora, we can cover almost the deficit of this university. So what would be your priority? I'm not trying now to flatter the university, but to show you how priorities change. So this is where we stand. Thank you very much. It was really a pleasure. I enjoyed very much being here with you. And uh, you can write to us anytime. Our internet system works well. And we'll uh, put you in touch uh, with the people. And good luck. And Mr. President, all the best wishes for you for your many, many years of 10 years to come. <laughs>